Right, are we live? This is the weirdest pub I've ever been in. Um, <laughs> so Mark and I have only just met each other. Um, we coordinated our clothing because we felt that we've got to set the bar really low. Um, I watched the movie last night. And you know, Mark, I've been working with people who, I know, this, for 25 years I've been watching a kind of people who lived a life that people used to think was... You know, the, it was described once as primitive affluence. You know, they had few wants, easily met, didn't work particularly hard. And I've been watching them be shoehorned into this kind of modern world of work where they've gone from being independent, living in the bush, hunting, gathering, to basically being dependent on wages, being dependent on bloody technology. You know, when I go to the Kalahari now, I mean, these cell phones are fucking everywhere. You know, they go from, you know, 25 years ago when I started working there, there was nothing. You were remote. You heard the sound of birds and bees at night, lions, hyenas. Now I hear little chirps. And I sit around the campfire with people, and people are playing bloody snake on some mm. cheap Chinese phone. Now, in a sense, they're being sucked into this journey in one direction, going from a really simple life to another. You, on the other hand, you've taken exactly the opposite route. And what was it? I mean, I want to know. I did a crap job, too. You know, I want to know, <laughs> what was it that made you decide to basically just up stakes, cut it all? Yeah, I guess my, my primary motivation was ecological. Uh, so this little speaker I'm speaking to right now, yeah, yeah. if I dissected that speaker and that little headpiece, uh, I could destroy the whole planet. Um, every single part of this, to make this come into existence, uh, is what's wiping out life on Earth. Uh, that's the reality of our situation. Um, so that was the first, that was the kind of the primary motivation. I guess from that point, I, I developed personal reasons for doing it. Yeah. Like, um, I always say there's this kind of uh, trade-off in life between aliveness and comfort. So we all live a very kind of comfortable life these days. You know, we've, you know, we, um, we can sit back in the evening, watch TV, watch Netflix. Um, but what we kind of sacrifice in doing that is the, our sense of aliveness in the world. Um, you know, I, I come back from fishing some evenings, it's pissing down rain, I, I'm, I'm wet, I'm tired, I'm sometimes hungry if I haven't caught fish, um, but I feel very alive. And I contrast that to the kind of my old life where you know, I came in in the evening, I, I had my ready meal, come in from work, you know, had a, kind of a, a nice day, I, but I felt dead. I had no sense of aliveness. So it's come from being a very theoretical, very kind of big yeah, picture yeah. ecological perspective into, um, into the very personal realm, you know, where, where um, I, I think we're all suffering. I think a lot of mental illness actually these days is down to the fact that we don't feel the sense of aliveness. We try to recreate it through bungee jumping and through kind of oh, more yeah. extreme stuff. No, well, this is, I mean, you know, it's a bizarre thing. And the last, actually, the favorite bit in my last book that I wrote is this kind of really weird story. You know, this place, Nyai Nyai, where I work, you know, and it's home to... It's home to the last place where any Bushmen, Kalahari Bushmen, still retain their land. And the only way that they can retain that land is by hosting foreign trophy hunters who come in. So you get these guys, mainly Germans and Americans, and what do they come? They come to shoot elephants. Hmm. You know, big bloody guns. And shooting an elephant's not that hard. It's kind of like shooting a barn door. But they make a sort of big deal of it. And what they do is they spend $50,000 for a single elephant hunt, a single trophy hunt. For an animal that they're not allowed to take under CITES rule, they can't even take the ivory back home. So they end up with a couple of photos on the corpse of this great thing. You know, the community is happy with it. They pay the money, the money gets to them, and you know, that's one way they have, bizarrely. The Bushmen sort of use this money as a way of keeping out of the capital economy. You know, if it wasn't for this money that came in through these hunters, um, you know, they wouldn't be able to sort of maintain the water points and everything. They'd be like everybody else being forced into these crappy cities mm -hmm. and so on. But this sort of whole bizarreness of these people who are working, you know, the ones, I, you know, the last one I documented, I did a photo story on them, was two dentists in Vienna. And they worked endless bloody hours to come out and shoot an elephant, to have this two, mo two weeks moment of sort of synthesized aliveness. You know, so there's this strange kind of trade-off in the economy of what we do and how we act. Yeah, there's a really strong disconnect. I think one thing technology does is disconnect us from the natural world. Yeah. Um, so you end up getting very odd behavior from that point, you know? I'd be really interested to know if you were saying that the Bushmen in the last 20 years, they've really taken on technology. Have you noticed a big disconnect well, in? It's, uh, 
yeah, it's sort of when I say taken on technology, you know, technology has a way, you know, Bushmen have a really interesting history of engagement. You know, they've been encapsulated for 200 years by farming cultures and all the others. Farmers, they rejected completely. They looked at the farmers with their cattle and their cabbages, and they're like, what the hell is this crap? We're not interested in that. You know, they managed to get, you know, so the Zhongwasi managed to live. Pretty much they got all their nutritional needs on the basis of maybe two hours work a day. And they spent the rest of the day sleeping, laughing, playing, flirting, loving, fighting, mm. basically doing life stuff. You know, and farming cultures come in and look at them and say, well, you guys are primitive. You should be, you know, you're practically monkeys living in the trees. And they kind of treat them like, treat them like crap. But the Zhongwasi effectively resisted it. You know, this idea that farming is some great step forward. Mm. They weren't into that because it was work. But what they would do, you know, like any decent, being a hunter-gatherer is about living very much in the now. You know, so you appropriate, you know, if technology is useful, you appropriate it. So things like, you know, when cattle ranchers started coming into the Kalahari and they'd stick up fences. You know, the Bushmen would be like, fence-wise, great, because you can actually hammer it out and you make a really good little arrowhead. So they were pretty good at, like, appropriating technologies and things that were useful. Um, and in the modern technology thing, the one thing that has seeped its way in there is bloody cell phones. And they're kind of everywhere. I mean, admittedly, Jean-Marcy is still used to shouting, so you'll have people, you know, when they... If you're talking to somebody at a distance, you shout. So it's sort of full of people shouting at each other in their bloody phones now. But it is a useful technology and that somehow people can connect with one another on it. But there is, you see this sort of growing, you know, there's, there's something seductive and there's something destructive about it. And, you know, this image I have in my mind of going back a couple of years ago, you know, and sitting with my name father, you know, this guy called Kaite Langman at the fire, and we used to always, you know, the fires are not used to, I, I'd sit there bored, unable to follow the language as well as I could, and so on. And suddenly watching people sitting around the fire playing on these cheap Chinese phones, which is the only thing they can afford, snake. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you have this blue glow in people's faces, and there was this kind of insidious, slow, kind of creeping weirdness. Yeah, and I guess the thing with those technologies as well is they're quite addictive. So mobile phones are very addictive, you know, um, smartphones in particular, social yeah. media is very addictive. I, I think the problem then with the addictiveness is you then need more and more of the same thing. And I think a lot of the problem of work is that we, we've created these lifestyles for ourselves that, are, that, are, that require a lot of money. Uh, and then to kind of, in, in order to pay for all the things that we now want, we have to work lots. Um, and there's been the old thing of, you know, we get to the 15 hour week, you know, 20 hour week, and it's actually the opposite. Like most people come home in the evenings now and have work, work emails, you know, work yeah, follows yeah. them everywhere. And that's in quite contrast to the Bushmen, you know. Well, it's, it's also people don't know what to do when they don't have bloody work to do. Yeah. You know, and people are crap at sort of sitting and whittling and, you know, doing the really simple things. And there's this kind of, you know, what there's been, and you see it again in the Kalahari with this kind of dependence now on the capital economy, the sort of overlaying of, you know, humans are purposeful. We do stuff. We make things. We build things. We craft. We are, we've evolved this ability to be makers, skill creators, skill finders. But suddenly now it's all been overlaid with this kind of extraordinary system of commerce based on this strange myth of, you know, economic scarcity. You know, we live in a world of hyperabundance. Yet all our economic models are based on this idea that actually our economies have to redistribute scarce resources. That is what our economies are. Every piece of economic theory that underwrites <laughs> monetary systems work is based on this idea of scarcity. Whereas if we look at human history and hunter-gatherer history, you know, for the 250,000 years Homo sapiens had been around, for 240,000 of the years, we were hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers operated on a system not of having infinite needs and limited means and having an economy to distribute these resources. They had limited ones that were easily satisfied. Mm. And that is why people got to relax. That is why the concept of work was loosely there. I mean, as we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, one day, if a hunting's easy, it's fun. It's only when hunting's hard that it's work. So work is just like a slightly negative way of looking at the basics of getting some energy. And if it takes too much of your time, it's not a great thing. Yeah, I think that thing you said about keeping your needs simple is, for me, key. You know, like I probably live on, I said, 10% of the poverty line in Ireland. Like I, I probably live off maybe one or two thousand pound a year. Uh, I used to live with no money at all. 
And the only, the only way you can actually do that is keeping your needs really simple. Like if you want the extravagant lifestyle, then unless you're on a very, very big wage, you have to work really hard for that. Um, and so yeah, I think, I think there's some kind of comparisons. Well, how about, you know, there's this idea that sort of, you know, they say no man is an island, you know, mm. we're, we're social creatures, you know, and in some ways, you know, money, a theory about the origin of money is that effectively it's a grammar syntax for social interaction. It's the way we navigate our relationships with other mm. people, you know, and you, as you, you know, you've got people who come and stay at the Happy Pig. On what basis do you kind of ground those relationships when you take away money as the kind of the medium through which it's expressed? What's the basis for our interaction? Yeah, what's, I mean, what's the ba you know, you talked about in the movie, it's mm. a sort of idea of sharing in a sense, or a bit like actually Lily, who was meant to be the third conversant here, this idea of a sort of a gift economy or a sharing economy <coughs> where the currency is not cash, the currency is what you're doing with each other. Mm. Yeah, so the gift economy is, yeah, it, it's a kind of a step on from the barter economy, which in some ways is a different form of money. Um, so, yeah, people come and stay, and we've got a free hostel where I live, uh, where uh, people rock up for all sorts of different reasons. Some come because they want to have some time out in nature, um, away from busy jobs. Some come and want to get stuck in. Um, what the gift economy kind of does is allow freedom for those people to come in and interact in whatever day they want. Um, so we offer the space for free. Yeah. Um, there's a kind of a magic in it in some ways, in that like you know, there's no guarantee that it's going to work out in a kind of what feels like a mutually beneficial arrangement. But for some reason it does. You know, for some reason the bills are always covered. Um, for some reason um, people come in exactly when they're kind of needed. You know, sometimes people come in with a, with a skill. Uh, that we've been waiting for for weeks, and you couldn't make it up in logical terms. Um, and it's in some ways, it's allowing that magic to happen when you take away money as a as a kind of a form of kind of rigid exchange. Because yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when I think about sort of you know, and I've been looking, and I talked with Lily, obviously loads, and impossible kicked off about this whole idea of the gift economy. And you know, with Jinwasi, with actually lots of hunter gatherer societies, things are inverted. You know, in our culture, if um, you have something that I want. You give it to me, and you exchange, you'd expect me to give you thanks for that. But it's, in, it's your gift to give to me that thing that I want. In our culture, we have demand sharing, which basically means if I have a look at you, I'd be like, yeah, Mark, I like that shirt. I do like that shirt, actually. And I say, can I have it? And you would be expected to give me that shirt. And what that system does, in a sense, in terms of detransactionalizing economy, it makes nobody want to own anything much because the minute you have something more than somebody else, they will ask you for it and you're expected to give it to them. So you have this kind of extraordinary regulatory process. You know, and this is this idea that actually people acting in their own self-interest produced a society which, you know, the word that was used by the early anthropologists who worked with them is fiercely egalitarian. And when you have a society where there's no expectation of thanks or please or you have to give something where you have it, there's no point in really owning a great deal mm. because somebody will just ask it. And it's extraordinary how that manifested in a society which lasted and endured. I mean, the last time I was on the stage, I had an hour to talk through that mm. history. You know, we now know that that Khoisan society, that Bushman society, lasted 150,000 years. You know, an extraordinary amount of time in one space. So while the rest of the world was still being colonized by Homo sapiens, you have the stable population living, we can only expect according to these kinds of rules and maintaining extraordinary stability, extraordinary environmental sustainability. Um, you know, so everywhere Homo sapiens moved to when they left Southern Africa, they wiped out all the megafauna. You know, that's why there are no cave bears and all that kind of crap here. Southern Africa is the last place in the world until now where we maintain the megafauna. It's only now that we've mm. had the bloody farming go in and you know, that we're losing our rhinos, our elephants, and all the big stuff and all these keystone species that make everything collapse. Yeah, which is quite contrary to popular understanding in some ways. You know, we, think, um, we think the opposite in popular culture. Well, it's an inversion of that whole yeah. narrative of, of progress. And only now, I mean, are we beginning to question sustainability when we think about progress? I mean, it's such a recent thing. You know, and as you say, you know, efforts like yours, if, in some ways, you know, we might be too late. Well, the question for me also is, what do we want to sustain? You know, we can, we talk about sustainability, as if you know if we can make this culture sustainable. I'd really question whether this this culture is even desire whether it's even desirable to 
sustain this culture. Yeah, no, it you know, is. It's, it's, it's a culture based on hyperviolence. Um, like we, you know, we see in the human level some kind of violence dropping, levels of violence dropping, but actually if you take in the whole of life, this is a very, very violent culture, and we're literally wiping out life on Earth. So why would we want to sustain a culture that's based on wiping out life on Earth? It's an absurdity in some ways. So I think we need to get back to the question of what kind of cultures will we, will we even want to sustain yeah. before we even think about sustainability? Because the culture based in this microphone I'm speaking into isn't a culture I personally want to be part of. It's, in, it's inherently unsustainable. It's inherently violent. But we have to include yeah. the whole of life um, when we think of these things, not just human life. The danger is it's just so bloody hard to get that. I mean, think, you know, you... You, people make movies about you because you've dropped out. And that's because it is such an exceptional thing to do. And most people, most of us, I mean, I'm sitting, you know, sitting, I've got two kids, you know, who demand Pokemon cards and all sorts of crap. You know, I find it, I would find it impossible to be able to sustain, you know, and as you've mentioned, sustain those relationships which embed me into this broader society with being able to drop out in the way that you have managed and the, you know the challenge for all of us and I sort of look at it you know and you found a solution for you and I look at it and I think how the hell do we get that I do not know yeah we're definitely in a big we're a, we're a conundrum you know it's it's we're at a point where there's no you go one direction and you go another direction in the boat of problems um, I think in reality I've thought about it for a long time I think we probably would need a crisis in order to change like I think we see, we experience that on the personal level. Like we often, like when we have addictive habits, uh, it's often when we experience a crisis in our own lives that we change. And I think the same is socially. Mm. I don't think we're going to make this kind of grand transition to yeah. a kind of a post-industrial society that's you know all beautiful and wonderful. Uh, it's not going to happen. We d we display none of the tendencies in our in our everyday life. I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a social breakdown of sort, or an ecological breakdown, probably more likely. Yeah. And that from that point, we'll have to change because we'll have no choice anymore. It's not a very optimistic, it's not a very inspiring perspective always, but I think it's the reality. Well, you, don't, you don't think a manifesto is going to do it? I don't think a manifesto <laughs> is going to do it tomorrow, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, I think it's going to be, you yeah. know, it's going to be a, a massive external impact to our way of life. Well, this is, I mean, this, this is, you know, the way I always think about it is that we're, extra, you know, we're a species that smokes. You know, we can continue smoking knowing that, you know, it's giving us lung cancer, emphysema, or whatever. We have this extraordinary ability as a species to shove the disorder, the chaos, you know, what we talked about earlier, the entropy to one side, to sort of be able to look forward in one direction, be like, well, I'm okay in the short term. And I think you're right. I think it's unfortunately going to take something absolutely bloody horrendous before that kind of shift that's going to happen. I'm sure it will happen. I mean, the world's a dynamic system, and it will certainly outlive us in its own peculiar way. Um, but in terms of any kind of short-term reality, I suspect, you know, all the goodwill in the world yeah. is not going to disassemble this massively complex system based on this idea of exchange and work and monetary value and value that we've superimposed on it. And, uh, you know, my hope is... I hope it's not too hideous when it happens. Yeah, I think the thing that actually gives me hope is that uh, we had a storm there a few days ago and all of the neighbours' electricity went out for a few days. And actually everyone was back out again, everyone was playing again. You yeah, know, yeah. It, was, it was actually like a really fun few days. Um, so why does it take us to have the electricity to go out, to have fun, you know, to get back together as neighbours again? So I actually think that something really wonderful could happen from uh, from a kind of a break from a breakdown of industrial society, I think it could actually get us back to, to relating to each other again, relating to the natural world around us. I don't think it has to necessarily be a bad thing. It could be a bad thing. It could get very messy, but I think if we think about it in the right way, it could actually bring us back together um, as communities and as people. So maybe on that note, it's probably we've probably had 15 minutes. I yeah, think. I think I don't know. I mean, people are beginning. I can't really see much, but they look sleepy already. <laughs> um, I know we got to get to the pub or something too. See, we're going to uh, continue this conversation at the pub, I think, in, in five minutes. So. Yeah. In which case, thank you all thank very, you very much, much for listening to our babble. Yeah.